Okay, so right, so we come again. So um, okay, so um, so C is going to be parallel space time. As I mentioned, it's what happens uh, to Minkowski space time when you take this uh, this this limit. And as a as a topological space, if you want them, it's an affine space. And I, I was saying that you can do this in any dimension. Most of my talk is going to be in three plus one dimension. Four. Um, and I'm going to give some coordinates. Uh, I'm going to call it P and X. And to tell you maybe the, the best way to introduce Carroll symmetry is to say what happens to uh, how, how the Carroll group acts on this affine space. So the, the Carroll group is a kinematical group. Which means that it contains uh, three kinds of rotations. There will be some rotation. In this case, rotations in three space-time dimensions. So, for example, we have so rotations. So this sends T X to T, and then you rotate the and this R here. They say rotation. You could take it to be any orthogonal transformation, but let me just restrict to the identity component. Then we, we have uh, boosts, so the Carolian boosts, and these are very different than the boosts in uh, Minkowski space time or in Galilei space time. Uh, this boost basically leave X alone and they change the time coordinate. So this is going to be X dot V and then X. And this V is uh, it's, it's a vector. And then you have translations in both uh, space and time. So we have uh, translations. Yes, it's a real number and a, a sorry, it's a vector. So as you can see, it's a 10 dimensional group. The same dimension as the Poincare group in four dimensions, and of course, it's a contraction of the at the level of the Lie algebra is a degeneration of the Poincare Lie algebra, um, and so anyway, so these together they generate uh, they generate the, the action of the Carroll group. So, so this is this is Carroll uh, yeah. So this Okay, so let's introduce some notation. So I'm going to call G from now on uh, the Carroll group. So, so uh, okay, so this is the Carroll group. And you can define it to be the subgroup of the affine group, which is generated by these transformations. So the Carroll group. As a, as a D group, what is it? Well, um, okay, it's. It's a semi-direct, so okay, so if you ignore for a moment the translation, right? This is a semi-direct product of SO3 and then the boost, and then all that acts on the translations. Right? So this is this is the rotations, this is the boost, and this is the translations. And a little bit later, we're going to take the universal cover of the Carroll group in which SO3 becomes the spin group, SU3. So that's, that, but I'm going to still call it G. But for now, it's, it's, it's okay to just. Uh... Okay, so, so this guy is sitting inside the affine group A4R because it's acting by affine transformations on this four dimensional affine space. So, so how's that? So, yeah. so for motivation, how, how do you uh, do you derive this from some Poincare symmetry? And yeah, yeah, you can derive this. You can derive this by doing the. This is this this is roughly speaking, the c goes to zero uh, limit. Uh, as mathematicians, we can take c goes to zero. As physicists, c of course is c. You cannot you cannot change it. So you need to then this do it in a slightly different way. Introduce another parameter. But essentially, um, you know, if you think of this light code as being all the things that look like all, all the points that satisfy that, um, then 
the, the sequence to zero limit basically says that x has to be zero, and that's exactly what this line is. It's a line x at the origin. And if you can, and, and then this can be implemented uh, at the Lie algebra level, for example, you can take the you can take the uh, Poincare algebra, introduce C, right? And then do a, do a contraction. You have to sometimes rescale things appropriately, but do a contraction in, in which C goes to zero, and you end up with a parallel algebra whose uh, Lie group acts on, 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 on the original Minkowski coordinates, if you wish, in this way. And we can, we, we can, we can okay. so, so let's, the, the Lie algebra, the Lie algebra, let, let's write it explicitly. It's going to be uh, generated by some rotation. So I here goes from one to three, some boosts, some uh, spatial translation, and some, uh, so this is time translation, spatial translation, boosts, and rotations. So I, one, two, three. And, um, and you can write down the, the, the Lie algebra is the standard one. It's a kinematical Lie algebra, which means that um, the brackets with J and any vector, it's, it's the vectorial representation. So let me write like this. Um, so this is going to be epsilon I, J, K, B, K. And B here could be J, could be B, or could be B. Of course, J, H is a scalar, so it commutes with J. And then all the other brackets are zero, except for uh, a boost and, and, a, um, and a translation that gives you uh, a time translation. So this is the Carroll algebra. And the reason, by the way, maybe I should mention already, the reason, the, the main observation behind this uh, fractal Carroll correspondence is the fact that, uh, I'll do it in a different part, just so that it's, it's a side comment, but maybe you guys find it more interesting. Um, there, there are some uh, fractonic systems with conserved charges, let me write like this, and some conserved dipole charges, so something like this, with this kind of a charge density. And uh, in, in the fractonic world, typically you also have some uh, angular momentum and some uh, linear momentum and some energy. And uh, if you ignore, so the energy, of course, these are all conserved quantities, so they commute to the Hamiltonian. So the the the, the, the energy commutes with everything. The energy operator, the Hamiltonian commutes with everything. But the algebra generated by Q, D, J, and P is isomorphic to the Carroll algebra. But the isomorphism says that uh, the fractonic Q and the fractonic dipole charge, this in, in, in the Carroll case, this goes to H. And this goes to B. So this is how the so the the, the, the algebras are also work well. The the fracton algebra is uh, isomorphic to Carroll plus a extra generator, which would be the energy of the Hamiltonian of the fractonic system, which commutes with all these guys. So so basically the particle will not move along any special direction in Carol. It depends on the there are many kinds of we will see there are many kinds of classical particles. Some Carol particles have fractonic uh, uh, interpretations. Immobility. One of so, so yeah, we, I will come to that in a moment, but the the what what we call massive uh, classical particles, Carol particles. They are analogous to the immobile monopoles, and the and a certain class of the massless Carroll particles. There are the dipoles which have some restricted mobility but can can nevertheless move. So that's that's the that, that's going to be the dictionary. But anyway, so this is this is what underpins the yes. This is what underpins the uh, the, the the this this Carroll. It's the isomorphism. So, so I mean, let me say it like this. So, so the fracton algebra, the fracton symmetry algebra, is isomorphic to in Carroll uh, plus R. Uh, okay. Yes. So, so and what's the difference of uh, you know carrot symmetry which we use a uh, Galilean symmetry? Well, in Galilean symmetry, uh, the boosts are different. 
So the rotations and the translations act in the same way, but the boosts are different. In Galilei case, the boost is okay. So let me do it. I'm doing it blue. I hope I don't get my hands dirty. But uh, so 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 let's compare with uh, Galilean boosts. Galilean boosts, you get d x. Well, t doesn't change, but x goes to x plus d v. That would be a Galilean boost, which is more. I mean, we're used to that, right? I mean, you just move in a constant velocity. Um, but this is different. This is completely bizarre in some sense. I mean, <laughs> physically, this is very strange. X doesn't change, but the time, uh, time changes. So in Galilei, we have absolute time. In, in Carolian, we have absolute space. So, well, yeah, we not go there. But okay. um, right. So um, let me. So this is Carol symmetry. Uh, so, any questions on this before I move on to the part of the Let me just stick to this part. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I started racing now. Yes, the, the boost in the curve symmetry, the boost uh, of t, t component of boost is the dimension is a little peculiar to t plus x dot v. Yeah. Then the, 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 the dimension is length square. Oh, okay. 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 I I I need to erase something. I can erase this. I mean, um, or what well, erase this? I'll keep the names of my collaborators, but uh, erase. Any other in any book? No, Alfredo Perez is in Chile in Valdivia. Stefan is in Edinburgh, but he's moving to Vienna uh, at the end of the summer. But he's been there for, well, I mean, during the pandemic, we were all, it was every, everything was very delocalized, but he's in Edinburgh, and he's there now. Okay, so, uh, right, so so the, let's talk about classical uh, particles. So, in the language of uh, Surya, this this is uh, a classical particle is the same thing as a, as a homogeneous uh, symplectic manifold of the Carroll group. But uh, but the Carroll group has no so-called symplectic cohomology, so this is the same thing as quadjoint orbits. So this is the same thing as the quadjoint orbits of uh, G. So I could tell you how the quadrant orbit, how, how they how they act. I'm not sure if it's important, but anyway. So um, so we can label. So so in Soyer's language, uh, elements of the so so elements of the dual of the Lie algebra, uh, they're called moments or momenta. Momenta. So um, a typical element in here, I normally call it alpha, but but you can actually parameterize it by the momenta associated to the symmetries, right? So associated to rotations, you will have angular momentum. Associated to translations, you're going to have linear momentum and the energy. And associated to the boosts, I don't know what to call them. In Galilei, it would be center of mass. But in Carroll, I'm not sure what to call them. But anyway, let, let me introduce. So we have J, K, E, and E. This, this, is, this is the way I'm going to label my momenta. And uh, just to, OK. Again, I hope I'm good. So, so this is angular momentum. This this is uh, linear momentum. Uh, this is energy, and uh, this is uh, boost momentum, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Center of mass. Sorry, was it this uh, equivalent between homogeneous symmetric manifold and quadrant orbit? It... Well, okay. Strictly speaking, uh, up to coverings. So. Simply connected homogeneous symplectic manifolds of the Carroll group are the universal covers of the quadrant orbits of the Carroll group. That's the correct mathematical statement. But this is only true because, well, uh, in 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 for for the Carroll group in three plus one dimensions, there's no um, there's no central extension, so there's no symplectic homology. Okay, uh, but anyway, um, so so I mean. Explicitly, given 
given my generators. So alpha uh, applied, so this is a linear function on the Lie algebra. So applied to ji, this is going to be little ji. Similarly, uh, applied to bi, you're going to get ki. Applied to pi, you're going to get little pi. And applied to h, you're going to get e. And then you can just work out, I mean, from, from, from here, you have enough information to work out the, well, from here you work out the Lie algebra. From the Lie algebra you work out the coadjoint representation, and you can you can you can ask how these things uh, transform under uh, rotations, boosts, and translations. So maybe I, I write that. Just I I'm not going to do any calculations in the seminar, so, but I'll just write it just so that you can at least see how, how it looks. And So if, if I have a group element, which I'm going to write it as a rotation boost parameter translation parameter like this. So this, I erased it, but this is the group element that would act, uh, in, well, in some ordering, but okay, so in that way. And uh, then I can consider the coadjoint action on alpha, on this, on this alpha. And this is going to give rise to some transformed uh, momenta. And the first thing you see is that the energy is invariant. So E is, uh, it's a Casimir. H, H the, the element H is central. So it's invariant under the adjoint action. So it's a Casimir, it's a linear Casimir. And therefore, its value on a quadrant orbit is, is constant. So it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's invariant. Um, the momenta they get rotated and then uh, like this. The boosts they get rotated like this. And the more complicated one is the it's the angular momentum that really changes in, in a slightly more complicated way, but it's easy to derive. So let me write it just just once so that you see it. And then we're not going to use it very much. Um, is it right? Yes. Okay, so this is the quadjoint action. And then uh, it's not difficult to see that there are, as I mentioned already, there's one invariant, so, so, so Casimirs. So the good thing about Casimirs is that they are uh, in, they're constant on quadrant orbits. So we can start looking at the orbits by basically setting different values to the Casimirs. So there's two obvious Casimirs. This guy is, uh, is invariant. But there's another Casimir which is invariant, which is um, W squared. And W squared is, uh, okay, it's the norm of a vector W. So what is this vector W? This vector W is E, sorry, not E, H, uh, H, uh, J, I plus epsilon I, J, K, B, J, So what is this? This is the spatial part of the uh, Pauli Lubansky vector of relativistic physics. The spatial part is invariant. Well, it transforms as a vector under the Carroll group, and therefore the uh, its norm, the square, its norm, the Euclidean, well, the Euclidean norm is invariant under the Carroll group. So okay. It's only in 3D. Eh? It's only in 3D. It's only in 3D, yes. Okay, so in higher dimension, okay, good question. I can tell you what happened in higher dimension. In, in higher dimensions, um, of course, um, right, in higher dimensions, um, there is a um, anti-symmetric matrix now. Let me write it as follows. So let me write again, so not E, but H. So this is anti these are all anti-symmetric matrices. So, um, okay. 
PM yield still back positive. So only J has anti-symmetric. So you need to so now so now this is this is anti-symmetric. This, this turns out to be an anti-symmetric. Well, its value on now this is an anti-symmetric matrix, and then what you can do is you can take trace of even powers of of this guy. So 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 now you do trace of omega to the two k, and 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 these guys are all different uh, casimirs. I'm not sure. If I haven't looked at this in, in general dimensions, so I cannot tell you exactly. But um, in this case, essentially, what we have is this is the this is essentially the trace of the square of this thing. If you write it write it as vectorial forms, you write it as some symmetric matrices. Uh, this guy is the trace of the square, is a equals one. And the other ones are not independent in this dimension, but of course, in high dimensions, they would be they would be independent. But anyway, so that, yeah, I, we can talk about this later if you want. But uh, this is all going to be in dimension three plus one uh, today. Okay, right. Um, so immediately we see, therefore, that we can begin to we, we can first classify the coagulant orbits depending on whether the item the energy is. Zero or different from zero. So, so we have uh, okay. So, so let's look at quadrant orbits. So, so alpha some element in D star, and then the quadrant orbit is just going to be uh, G active or not. We have the quadrant representation. So this way. And first of all, we have uh, the orbits for which uh, E is different from zero, right? E is invariant, so we, this corresponds to the value of the Gassinger, H. So uh, orbits for which E is equal to zero, uh, it turns out that you can always, by an adjoint, if, if you give me any, any set of momenta here with E different from zero, if you give me one of these guys with e different from zero, I can always do an adjoint transformation to get rid of k and p. You can you can show that. So you can bring it to a kind of a normal form, and the normal form is going to be so. So you can always bring it to normal form, which is going to be one over e times w. But w okay, w is going to be e j plus p cross k. So EW and then zero, zero, and E. You can always bring it like that. And then uh, they're dictated by essentially the norm of uh, that's exactly it, by the way. This, yeah. So so it's dictated. So there's two possibilities. Either this W is zero or this W is different from zero. And uh, what is what is the dimension of this orbit? Well, if W is zero, what is the stabilizer of, of, of this of this covector of this momentum? The, the stabilizer is well, H is central, so it acts trivially, so H is always there. But then because this vector is zero, then you get the whole rotation. So the stabilizer of this orbit is SO3. So this is a stabilizer, is SO3 cross R. That's dimension four. So this orbit has dimension 10 minus 4, which is 6. So this is a six-dimensional quadrant orbit. If, if W is different from 0, it singles out a direction. And then the, the, the symmetry gets broken to the SO2 around that. So the stabilizer in this, this, this is an eight-dimensional, these are the largest orbits. This is an eight-dimensional orbit with stabilizer SO2 plus R. And we give names to these things, and the names are working names, but we, we, we call this a, a spinless a massive particle. Uh, and we call this spinning massive particle. If you don't have a separate definition for math? No. We, we, the reason we call them massive is because the stabilizer looks similar to the, the one of massive particles in uh, in in, in uh, in Minkowski, in, in the Poincare case. So by analogy, this is purely, take, take, take these things with quotes. I mean, we, we're just calling them that because they look analogous, right? A uh, SL3 is, would be the little group of a, yeah. of a massive uh, particle. So, okay. So let me tell you, uh, before I go on, just to be able to, to write things down, 
I can uh, remind you a little bit what what coagulant orbits look like. I mean, I'm telling you the dimensions, but what are they as as, as manifolds? So, so this is a small escolium, if you wish, on on coagulant coagulant orbits of uh, of groups that are semi-direct products with this guy up in here. And I'll give you the answer basically. So, if, so, so alpha, okay, this is an element in G star, but, but G star, of course, this looks like you can write it as the direct sum of the dual of this group and the dual of the abelian group. Let me call it D for a translation, right? Because there, in this case, there's a translation. Uh, let me write it in this way as uh, kappa and tau. So kappa is dual to K, tau is dual to Q. And the coagulant orbits of such a product, O alpha, it turns out that they are bundles over. Okay, so, so let me let me define uh, O tau. This is the K orbit of tau. So K acts on T, which is a semi direct product. K acts on T, so K acts on the Lyalder of T, and therefore K acts on the dual of the Lyalder of T. So K acts on tau, and it will give you some orbit, right? This guy will look like. K mod the stable, this is a stabilizer of tau in K. And then it turns out that the coadjoint orbits of G, they fiber over the O tau. So basically, we have it's a double, it's a fibered product, I'm afraid. Uh, it looks like this. So, um, so there's two things here. So one is the cotangent bundle of this guy. And here what we have is um, okay, it's 22. Okay, so let me let me define kappa sub tau to be this guy restricted to the stabilizer. Okay, so this guy is dual to, to k. This is a subgroup of k, so the Lie algebra of this guy is a subalgebra of this, so I can restrict it to that. So that k tau. And this is going to be a, this turns out to be a representation of the, um, it's, it's, sorry. So this is, this is, if you wish, an element in, in the dual of this guy. And you can talk about its coadjoint orbit under K. Anyway, um, this is a homogeneous vector bundle, or yeah, homogeneous vector bundle. This is a homogeneous space. There's a homogeneous vector bundle with fiber. The coadjoint orbit of it. I mean, let me not go into many details, but basically that's the that's the, that's the, the coadjoint orbits of a semi-direct product, fibered products over the uh, a orbit of the translational component of alpha. And you can work out the dimension for this. The dimension of, of alpha is going to be the dimension of the cotangent bundle of alpha. That's that's twice the dimension of the orbit. So, the dimension of the orbit plus the, the dimension of this guy. But this is a quadrant orbit, so this is even dimensional, and this is even, even dimensional by construction, so this is even dimensional, so it's uh, as you would expect. Um, anyway, so this is just to, to remind you what these guys look like. So then I can tell you what these guys look like. Uh, so in this case, O tau. It's an it's the it's a three dimensional affine space with, with the energy B whatever okay, let's call this value of the energy in zero so let's call this E E is generic so E is, is zero which is different from zero so so this is the this is an affine hyperplane in A four no in momentum space that says the energy is equal to this non zero constant and then uh, this this orbit is uh, this this orbit is the cotangent bundle of the of this three dimensional affine space. This one is slightly more complicated. This is this is um, this has a two sphere here, which is the 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 rotation. You you have a, a given W, but then you get the whole sphere uh, with the same length as that guy. So this is slightly more complicated. 
this looks like the cotangent bundle. Uh, let me write like this of the, uh, I guess, the two sphere. Yeah, so it looks something like, like a fiber product. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's bad notation, but also to, to be perfectly, okay, to be perfectly, uh, so this would be this, this other bundle. Okay, so these are the so called massive uh, orbits. Ah, sorry, I wasn't supposed to write there. Uh, um, you also have massless orbits, and those are much more interesting in some sense when E is zero. So let's see what happens when E is zero. So Well, okay, luckily I, I text this. When, when E is zero, uh, some things disappear. So when E is zero, this guy uh, doesn't do anything. Here, this, this would be E, so, so this also disappears. So the, only, the, 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 the value of the second Casimir is P cross K uh, norm squared. But you can use the standard formula, so this is the norm of P, the norm of K minus P dot K square and it turns out that you can see this immediately from here that each of these terms is separately invariant right the norm of p is invariant because p only changes by rotation the norm of k is invariant and their dot product is just invariant so uh but okay but but so 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 the, the other case is the e equals zero orbit so here we have two possibilities we have either p cross k is equal to zero or P cross K um, is different from zero, right? These are the value of the two Casimirs. But then this, this, this guy being to zero, this, I mean, there are a lot more invariants now. So, so this, this is not one, or, one class of orbits, but different kinds of orbits. So, um, okay. So, so this breaks up into many different possibilities because this, this can be zero in many ways. This can be zero because P and one of them is zero, or they're non-zero but parallel. So we have four possibilities. Uh, let me let me let me kind of write them. So this could be that they're both zero, or one of them is zero, but the other one is not. Or uh, Neither are zero, but parallel. But parallel. Okay. Um, and this one, uh, this is an observer. And you can work out what these guys look like. I mean, uh, in th this case breaks into further whether this now is, because if P and K are zero, these terms are gone. Everything here is zero, but J changes by uh, rotation. So the absolute value of J, the, the norm of J is an invariant. So it could be zero or it could be different from zero. Okay, and so, so we have all these different kinds of orbits. Um, I, I can sort of tell you the dimensions of the wish, but I, I don't want to go into the same level of detail. Um, is it J? Hang on, it's a plus meter. Excuse me? J square. J yeah, and total angular moment. Only when P and K are zero. If P and K are both zero, the the, the norm of J is, is customary. But in general, no. Anyway, uh, all these guys, by the way, they are related by automorphisms. I didn't say automorphisms of the Garo algebra. So let me. Let me write it here very, very quickly. Um, where can I write? Let me write it here. So automorphisms. Maybe that's not a good color to use. Okay, so automorphisms of the Carroll algebra, uh, which fix the angular moment, which fix, because you can always rotate, but let, let's say which fix these guys. 
Well, uh, you can you can you can you can basically uh, it's GL two R. Uh, so so this this looks like GL two R, and it's acting in the following way. So uh, let's write B and P like that, um, and you know A B C D. So anyway, so 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 B and P change in this way, and A ch changes by the determinant. So all these cases here are related by automorphism. If B and K are parallel, which is the generic case, then you can always, by uh, by by a change of basis in that space, bring it all all to you know to, to one axis or the other. We saw these two things. So this is this is different. I mean, when when it's zero, it's zero. But these three cases they're related by automorphism. So the orbits are are isomorphic. So anyway, so so um, so these guys are all related by auto by auto. So in a way, they're the same orbit with any different ways. Um, okay, so I can tell you a bit about. Let me let me write down the dimensions just to you know. So I'm a bit uncomfortable with treating J as classical variable. J do they do not form. They form as well three as well. No, no, little j, this is the, the little j is the angular. Little j is not the algebra element, it's the momentum, it's the angular momentum. It's the, it's the dual, it's in the dual. But you can diagonalize only one, that's the x or the y. Well, but you can have, you can imagine particles with no angular momentum, right? So this is zero. a classical picture. This. this is classical, this is, this is classical particle. So coadjoint orbits of the, of the Carroll group. So you can imagine orbits where J is zero. It's definitely possible. Anyway, so this one, everything is zero. So, so this is this is zero dimensional orbit. This is the origin of the coalgebra. This is this is this is dimension. So dimension. This is dimension zero. This one is, is dimension two. It's the two sphere of of radius J, right? The radius whatever. So it's a standard two sphere. So we, we have names for these things, which are as bad as the as those. Uh, so so this we call the vacuum because it's and this we call a spinning vacuum. Treat this with some treat this with a pinch of salt. I mean, these are names just for us to refer to them easily. Um, all these guys, so 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 these guys, these are four-dimensional orbits. Um, okay, uh, they look like cotangent bundle of the two sphere. This this is a point. This is a two sphere. This cotangent bundle of the two sphere. This one is the most complicated one of these. This is dimension six, and it looks like uh, cotangent bundle of the two sphere. Uh, cross. So what is the what is the what is the analogous to O tau here is a, is a two sphere, um, and uh, it 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 well okay it's k cross k tau and the cotangent bundle of the circle. I mean this requires explanation, but let me just say it, it's it's like that. So it's four plus two six dimensional. And, and we call these guys generically, we call this massless. So this, this, this is kind of the general massless, and these are slightly more spectral where these two things are parallel. The momentum and the boost thing are parallel. Okay, so that's the that's kind of the classical particle story. Um, what we can do with the with this coadjoint orbits is to write down particle dynamics as you did to them. So let me say very briefly how we do that. Um, okay, so uh, particle dynamics. So suppose you have some coadjoint orbit, right? So this is going to be the Carroll group mod the is the stabilizer of the 
of the momentum that you're looking at. So this is a homogeneous space of G. So we, we have this so-called orbit map. Let me call it pi. This takes a group element and acts on, on alpha, right? So the image of this, this is surjective onto the onto the so it's, so it's the orbit map. So now these coadjoint orbits they have invariant symplectic forms, the the, the Kirillov Kostan Surio, right? So Omega, this is the Kirillov Kostan Surio. So, so Omega is a two form on the quadrant orbit. Is the KKS symplectic form. Omega at the point alpha acting on, let's say, uh, two, you know, vectors associated to whatever. This is this is um, this is alpha acting on X Y. You want that's a point what the, what this looks like um and you can pull it back to g so well b commutes with pullback so this is the closed form this is a closed two form on g right so this is this is a two form on g it's closed but of course it's not degenerate so it gives a pre-symplectic this is a pre invariant pre-symplectic structure on the group but it's actually exact this, I think, is minus D of alpha theta, where this is the left invariant Mara Cartan form. And then what you can do is the following. Suppose you have a curve in the group. So gamma is a curve in, in the group. And then I can define an action functional, which is integrating over the interval, the parameter space of the curve, of a Alpha with the pullback of theta. And this gives you uh, dynamical systems. It gives you extremals, or you, you, you look at the Euler Lagrange equations of this stuff, you, you, and you can project down from the group to any space, uh, uh, any, any homogeneous space. Of course, if you project down to this orbit, you get momentum alpha, or maybe something in the coadjoint orbit of alpha. But you can project it down if this group had another homogeneous space, for example, in this case, the Carroll group has Carroll space time. You can project this curve down to Carroll space time and they give you particle trajectories on Carroll space time. And you can write actions for them. I mean, the action kind of pushes down. So let me give you an example of, uh, of one of these things. So if we take, if you take, if you take the, the if you take, uh, the the spin spinless vacuum. So you think you think alpha to be this guy. Right? So this is the this is what we call the what massive spinless particle. If you do that and you work out this action, this this then, this gives you a Lagrangian, which once you write it in canonical form with moment uh, whatever, it looks like T dot E plus the B x dot plus the Lagrange multiplier that sets E to be naught. And therefore you see, for example, immediately that uh, if you vary with respect to T, you find that x, x dot is zero. So the Euler Lagrange equations for this in particular tell you that x dot is zero, so the particle doesn't move. So this is the analog of a uh, infractonic language. This is the, this is this would be the analog of when you, you remember that the energy is the charge in fractonic language. So this is a monopole of charge which doesn't move. So this is an immobile monopole. And okay, I mean this is the simplest one to describe. I mean you can do this for all the quadrant orbits that I wrote down. You can write down actions and and you you find that in some cases the 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 restriction is the, the mobility is restricted to some subspace. Some, and, and for example, if you do this for the for one of these ones, I guess this one is the simplest one to do. Um, although they're all equivalent, but I mean, if you do this for this one, you get um, well, okay, yeah. So, I guess the parallel case, um, you get something analogous to the. 
dipoles, which can only move in the dipole direction. Because remember that the in the fractonic language, this K is the dipole moment, right? So I guess if you're doing the, this one, P and K are parallel, that means the momentum is moving only along the, 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 the dipole direction. So, but okay, that, that's, I don't, I don't want to go to more examples because they get increasingly complicated. That, that's kind of just the simple one to give a, to give a feeling for the, for the story. Okay, so clearly, I'm not going to have time to do a lot of uh, uh, stuff with the. Where would you get Lagrange multiply? This is because we wanted to we wanted to write this. What happens when you do this thing is that you find that the momentum is it, that there's a there's a constraint, and if you want the momentum so E and P to be in to be unconstrained, then you need to introduce a Lagrange multiplier to, to impose a constraint. So the, what I mean by canonical action is that the momenta and the and the coordinates are independent. But of course, what happens in these things is that we know that E is, is constrained to be a constant, so you need to put a Lagrange multiplier. And then this Lagrange multiplier basically tells you when you when you differentiate with respect to E that T dot is known as lambda, so T can change, but X doesn't. So it's there is a fixed uh, Okay, so um, yeah, I'm not sure whether to get into the business of the whole Carroll's particle. But the, the, I can I can give you an idea of the of the method. I don't know of what do you suggest I do. I mean, I can tell you a little bit about the quantum Carroll thing. Um, so I'll just I, I won't go into any details, but I'll, because of lack of time. Sorry, I raised my collaborator's name. Um, but um, I can sort of tell you how we go about doing this. So in principle now, of course, you have coadjoint orbits that are symplectic manifold. You could geometrically quantize if the if the orbit is quantizable, right? So if the if the if the period of constant so your symplectic form is integral in, in a suitable sense. Then it's the curvature of some line bundle with connection, and you can you can you can begin to talk about the geometric quantization of these quadrant orbits, but that's too difficult, so we don't do that. Um, so instead, we use uh, let me just say it in words. Let's say the quantum particles. We we just use the induced representation. So 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 basically, what we do is we do the following. So. So we're using this representation, like in one very. So we um, we choose a something in the dual, yeah, like like in the description of the of the orbits. We choose we choose the the this this dual, uh, and then we have this orbit. Um, yeah, that's missing this fragment. So. Um, and this is uh, k mod k now. So that, that introduces a stabilizer the order. And then what we do is we 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 choose a let me call it w. This is going to be a unitary uh, irreducible uh, representation of the stabilizer of this guy. So this is the data. And uh, this tau defines okay, so then then what you do is you you can construct um, you can construct over this orbit space or over the orbit of tau. You can construct a um, associated vector bundle associated to this representation of k tau. So let's call it I don't know e so w. So this is going to be uh, k k tau w, and this is a this is this is a bundle over o tau, and if if the orbit admits a k invariant measure, then which does in these cases, in these cases, in, in our cases, O tau is going to be either uh, this three dimensional affine space or the sphere or a point. So the point, of course, well, I don't need to measure anything, but here you have a, and, and k, what is k? k uh, is um, its rotations and boosts. And it turns out that. Uh, uh, 
the, the Euclidean measure here and the round metric measure on the, on the two sphere, they are K invariant. So you can use those. So anyway, so, so that allows you to, um, that allows you to define. So, 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 so the Hilbert space is going to be the L2 sections of this bundle relative to the, to the metric given by, um, you know, this, this is the unitary e -rep, So you have a pointwise metric on the fibers, a pointwise inner product. And then you uh, integrate that with respect to the invariant measure. So you get some kind of L2. Uh, so what is this? Uh, this one. Sorry, E W. I forgot your name already. So you get a representation, and and, and you can the the, the Mackey theory, which works for the semi-direct product groups, um, guarantees that every unitary irreducible representation of the Carroll group is obtained in this way. So basically, all you need to do is uh, analyze. You know, you you go through each of these guys. You, you know, you choose a different house, you get different old house, you look at the stabilizer, you have to classify the unitary e reps of that. In many cases, this guy, for example, uh, here, this is SO3, or if you want to go to the universal cover, SU2. So we're talking about unitary e reps of SU2. Okay. In this case, slightly more complicated, uh, you, you have to, uh, this is some sort of Euclidean group. So you need, uh, unitary irreps of the Euclidean group. So you have to run this whole process again for the Euclidean group because it's a semi-direct product with an abelian factor and so forth. Anyway, you can do this and you can you can you can list you can you can you can you can, you can list um the the the, the, the Hilbert spaces and you can give formulas for the action of the Carroll group on sections and all that. The thing is that I mean I could give you the list it's not the um, the thing is that, of course, as in the case of Poincaré, this description is happening in momentum space, right? Because this orbit, I mean, this 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 orbit is in momentum space. So o, o tau lives inside uh, the dual to the translation. So this lives in momentum space. And sometimes you would like to understand the representations as fields in the space time. So as fields in parallel space time. So that requires. Um, Two things. So, 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 okay. So, this is momentum. I'm sorry, I, I'm basically uh, summarizing lots of stuff. But this is a momentum space description. If you want to, if you want to describe these things in, in terms of fields in Carroll space time, then you need to do two things. The, there is a standard so called covariantization. So, okay. So, you want to go from, from here. To fields in uh, Carroll space, and for that you need so the, so the, the, the okay so I'm done. Give me just I'll, I'll finish with this. So the first thing you have to do is to choose um, an irrep. Let's call it V of K, such that when so such that when so so this 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 contains W plus maybe but like actually it doesn't have to be direct sum. So um, it's an irreducible representation of K, which when you reduce it, you break you 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 break it on the, uh, you view it as a representation of, of K tau. It contains W. So so W in B as K tau rep. But that's a choice. And the same thing happens in relativistic uh, physics, right? I mean, uh, for Poincaré, you could choose, you could you could make different choices, and you get equivalent representation, but maybe not equivalent physics. I'm not sure. Um, but the second one is you do this sort of group theoretical Fourier transform to go from momentum space to the space time. So I can give more detail on this. I mean, there's a, there's a well-defined notion of group theoretical Fourier transform. To go from sections of this W to, to uh, sections of some uh, some homogeneous vector bundle over the parallel space line. And then what happens is that depending on the V that you have chosen, you may need to project to W, and that gives you field equations once you uh, Fourier transform. Anyway, so uh, there's only two 
of, 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 of the particles, there's only two that seem to admit um, descriptions as finite component fields in parallel space. And uh, these particles, so, so there's, so, so the end result of this is that there's, there's basically two, uh, one, one thing that I call the elect, we call the, you know, people call the electric and kind of magnetic. Uh, and okay, I mean, I could write down the fields and all that, but they basically, um, Lagrangian. I, yeah, I didn't write down the Lagrangian, actually. That's a good point. Um, I wrote, I can write down the representation, uh, the Hilbert space and the equations in principle that, uh, that they satisfy. Um, so, so this one is some field that depends on T and X. Uh, and basically the only equation is that this guy looks like something like, it's a complex, it's not complex, right? So it looks like something like minus E zero phi or something like that. It's, it's just, and, and there's no condition on the X. But this one's here, they don't depend on, they don't depend on T, they only depend on X. Um, and the, I, the, the equations are, well, there it depends on which V you choose. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated story. Um, I can write them as high as weights, states in some representation, and there are some operators which tell you that it's a highest weight. And, uh, highest weight of a representation of SU2, so it's easy. So you, you have to be killed by the uh, racing operator, let's say, and then the racing operator under the Fourier transform becomes a differential operator. But I haven't written on the grand so that's something maybe I can think about doing. But anyway, um, yeah, so the, sorry, uh, obviously I'm rather of time to tell you the, the whole uh, quantum story. But um, but yeah, you can write down a couple of of this whole family of coadjoint orbits. There's two that give rise to uh, fields with finite number of components. This phi is not necessarily a scalar. This, this phi is state values in a finite dimensional representation of SU2. So spin, spin S representation. Um, but they satisfy two dimensions. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Sorry, I, I rushed at the end of the yeah. I have a very nice question about the classical curve particle. So the the equation of motion associated to the kind of Lagrangian that you can write, can they be interpreted in terms of geodesic equation on the Carrier space time for some appropriate material correction? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, so, of course, in in, uh, in in the case of relativistic physics, this is exactly what happens, right? I mean, uh, if you have a, if you have a geodesic in for, for for the spinless particles, for example, if you have a simple geodesic on on Minkowski space time. Then the 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 geodesic with respect to the Chibita connection these are straight lines, and uh, you can you know you know that there's a okay. So if you have a if you have a Imani and Lorentzian manifold, um, and, and if you have a geodesic, then the inner product of the geodesic vector with a killing vector. So this is killing. Uh, this this is constant along the geodesic, right? So. Uh, so 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 this gives you this gives you so this 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 is killing vector with respect to some x in the Lie algebra, right? So you get x in the Lie algebra and you get a number. So so the geodesic is a, is a if you want the geodesic is a machine that gives you to an element in the Lie algebra a real number. Therefore, it's an element in the in the dual. So and this is the momentum. This is the this is the and and what happens is that of course, two, two different observers that are related by a Poincaré transformation may not agree on this number. But 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 they agree in the sense that they're in the same quadrant orbit. So this gives you momentum. So this 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 this, this thing here, this 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 is the same thing as giving you some momentum associated with the geodesic in here. And if you make it, if you make a Poincaré transformation, the geodesic goes into another geodesic. And the the machine, you know, the element, the, the moment of that geodesic is the coadjoint action of the Poincaré transformation and alpha. 
So they would agree on the quantum orbit. So indeed, quantum orbits, the momenta associated to quantum orbits, in the case of uh, at least spinless particles, uh, it's, it's important that it's spinless. So that for the spinless particles in, in, in the Trotsky space time, so they can be interpreted as just. So the action that you get would be geodesics and the, you need geodesic with respect to the received connection. For the, for the spinning particles, it's a bit more complicated because they, they do have some internal degrees of freedom that live in the two sphere of um, angular momenta. So there, I'm not sure whether there is some sort of connection in this whole space that, that, mm -hmm. that will give you. And so, and, and I don't know, really, to be honest, um, that's something I don't understand. You see, in the sense that I know how it works for geodesics, you have a metric, but when you don't have a metric, I'm not sure if I could go from directly, except yeah, through this other. Approach. I mean, I don't know how to go this directly from from geodesics relativism connection to yes. even if they work. So, 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 yeah. Sorry, maybe I should have started like this. Even if that were the case, how would you prove it? <laughs> In the sense that, um, okay, you have geodesics with respect to some invariant connection, maybe. And then the question is, how, how do you gen, how do you get your element in? How do you get the momentum associated to that? I know how to do it here because I'm a metric. I get a number, but in general, I'm not sure how to do it. Maybe, maybe you know how to do it. Maybe there is a way to. I mean, I, I, I would like to understand. I mean, that's a very good question, and I, I've thought about it, and I cannot, I cannot give you an answer because I only know how it works in the case of the Sudanian geometry. I don't know in general. Uh, yeah, so we can talk to you on the original so I think that you can uh, derive it from the uh, uh, Lorentz synergy by redefining the velocity and then sequence zero moment, right? But not, but the orbits don't all. They that that works in some cases. That works to relate the the algebras, but it doesn't send orbit to orbit. It gets it's slightly complicated this map. It works in some cases. Um, so. Even yeah, it works. It works for some orbits. So so, okay. So so if you if you if you look at the okay, so we have you know the light cone and we have these guys, the time light guys and the space light guys, and then you you can you can say well what happens to these things in the c goes to zero dimensions, and they don't necessarily go. I mean the the orbits for. Um, I mean, this is this is at the level. Okay, this is at the level of the O tau. Right? So the O tau don't seem to match very well because the, what we I don't know how to do it, but I mean, what we would like to see here are these. These are the A threes. Uh, you know, E equals C zero, and then uh, you know, but then there is uh, the 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 E equals zero thing. Then what you have are the origin and then two spheres. Now, I told you that the Carroll limit was basically this guy going to this, but this is true in the tangent space. In the dual space, it's the opposite. It's the Galilean thing. It's where the uh, is where the this guy gets flattened. So, so this 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 guy seems to be this 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 seems to be okay in the sense that when you flatten this, you get this plane, but then uh, the you know, you get the the the, the, the light cone itself give you like the origin, and then and then I guess you have uh, this this paraboloid kind of give you the sphere. I, I mean, I need to think about it, but 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 I'm not sure how to get these planes uh, as limits. These other ones as limits. Maybe I'm just not smart. <laughs> I'm definitely not smart enough. So. Clearly, clearly, maybe I just don't, don't see how it, how, how, how it goes. But I don't think that the orbits, normally under contraction, orbits don't go to orbits. For example, um, uh, there's always a contraction to an abelian algebra. And abelian algebras have trivial quadrant actions. So all the orbits are points. So that already shows you that you don't expect that. Uh, yes, I have a question what is the metaphysical relevance of this energy? For example, I heard about this connection to a DNS or some black hole horizon symmetry. So, do you have an idea? Yeah, so, so, um, right. 
So it's a bit different. It's not necessarily the Carroll group uh, per se, but uh, there's a notion of Carrollian geometry that I'm sure Kevin can tell you a lot more about. Um, and it's the natural geometry for null hypersurfaces in Lorentzian space times. So black hole horizons, um, you know, null infinity, all these kind of null hypersurfaces, they have some sort of Carolian structure. In the, in the case of null infinity, you only get a conformal Carolian structure. But in the case of a black hole horizon, you would get a Carolian structure. And, and then what happens in the Carolian structure, in Carolian geometry, uh, what substitutes the metric is a pair consisting of a, uh, of a vector field and some sort of uh, degenerate metric, let me call it H. Uh, and this degenerate metric is such that it has one degenerate direction, which is the direction of this vector field. And then you can ask the question, what is the Lie algebra of symmetries of this, i.e., uh, what are all the vector, what are all the vector fields on your manifold uh, such that the Lie derivative of this guy is zero and the Lie derivative of H is zero? And if this were non-degenerate, then killing transport basically says that the dimension of the symmetries is bounded above by n n to the one over two, so it's finite dimension. But because this, this is not de this is degenerate, this happens to be infinite dimension. There's an infinite number of it's an infinite dimensional the algebra of symmetries of, of this data. And for Carroll spacetime, uh, this gives rise to I, I guess a version of BNS. BNS. Well, like, what I mean. Yeah, I mean, not the strict series, but the conformal version of it. Yeah, BMS is the control. Okay, good, good point. So, if you consider, uh, for example, this guy being minus this and this guy being twice H, you look at vector field that satisfy that, I suppose. Is it or is that too much? This one, but uh, maybe. Uh, no, but minus some function times this. Um, then this this is this 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 agrees with BMS at least in three no? BMS three I don't know what BMS is in general. Um, I guess it agrees with. Yeah. Then you are starting a uh, transformation, which is a global transformation, is it from tensor K to this this infinity dimension. Well, if so, you do this for Carroll space time, then in particular. Uh, Carroll group, the generation of the Carroll group preserve this data that will be with f equal to zero. So they are contained. F equal to zero. They are contained in there. They're the, yeah. But but even if but even but but even so, they're not all. So if you put here zero, so like this, this is still infinite dimension. To make it finite dimensional, you need to essentially look at automorphisms not of this structure but of the Cartan geometry associated with this. You need also an adaptive connection. And then you get the automorphism because this is a general fact that automorphisms of any Cartan geometry are always fine. Dimension. But unless you have the full Cartan geometry, you don't get necessarily fine dimensional. What happens in the case of, of Riemannian geometry is that, of course, given the metric, you get a unique connection that is canonical, right? The, the and therefore you have the canonical. But in general, it's fine. This is why in GFT, there's also this kind of between direction as an actual valid current because GFT doesn't know about the connection part of the structure. It's like preserving these two, only these two ingredients and not the mm -hmm. So the double field theory version of Carroll is only weak Carolian? It's weak. Right. Um, And to conclude, can you sum up in just one pitch the Carroll fraction corresponding? Well, it's basically I already mentioned a little bit. It's it's the the, the Carroll fraction correspondence is basically this 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 isomorphism of, of the algebras, and then what you can do is you can uh, you can hazard a, a kind of correspondence, right? So in this, this is part of it in the fact that a massive, what we call massive spinless, part of classical particle of Carroll has a fractonic interpretation as an immobile monopole once you make the, 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 the dictionary of energy going to charge and whatever. Um, and, and we can do the same thing for, not for all of them, not, not, I don't think all of them have an 
immediate fractonic interpretation, but um, well, I erased it here, but the, the ones where they're parallel, the dipole and the momentum are parallel, this is exactly motion along the dipole. This is this restricted mobility of, of, of the dipole in the in this kind of fractonic thing. Uh, I mean, it, it's that that is the level of the it, it's just that by analog the, because the fracton algebra is just Carroll plus R and, and the plus R doesn't this is central so it doesn't act on the algebra so the algebra are the same so it's really a question of interpreting the same geometric object as either a Carroll algebra or a fracton of some kind and we can do this for only two of them at least uh, I mean again I'm a tourist in the fracton world so I, I don't know I've been reading a paper in the about spin glasses that talk about different states of matter associated to um, fractons being one of them and linions and planons and whatever um, and I can sort of see how to describe these things in terms of algebras and coagulant orbits I should mention there's an extension of this work involving also Simon Pekka that has been visiting Edinburgh and we extended from fractals to these linions and planions and all kinds of uh, exotic faces of matter. But um, yeah. By the way, it, something interesting that maybe wasn't obvious uh, to me it wasn't. Over the two sphere, right, the two sphere is complex projective line. So you've got these nice holomorphic bundles, O n, right? Uh, all of them carry a unitary reducible representation of the Carroll okay. of the four dimensional Carroll. So when you do this business of induced representations for this orbit for the S two, you you find that what you get well you, you get many different things, but in particular you get that um, the um, the so 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 L L two sections of O n for any n. The O and bundles sort of the complex predictive line, they carry a representation, unitary reducible representation of the Carl. I don't know if anything. So these are this this from from in this picture, these are momentum space description. These, these are this kind of the ONs are examples of the C values. Because there are some some powers that the stabilizer is SO2 semi-directory. The boosts and this SO2, uh, it's U1 basically, and the uh, irreducible representations are determined by an integer. Actually, that's negative, it's O minus n is corresponding to the representation of the weight n, personally, is our choice to admit. But anyway, it's uh, yeah, so 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 O n section, not holomorphic sections, by the way, but really all all sections. Or the Hilbert space of L2 integral sections of O n over the two sphere. This gives uh, irreducible irrec, irre unitary irreducible irrec of the yeah. representation of the curl group. I, I didn't know that. It just came out of the analysis. Okay. I have a In this case, can you say that the energy is bound long? Energy, because you have identified Hamiltonian with charge in, in preference. Charge can take both sides. Correct, you know, yes. Finest in this case. Well, so um, if by energy, so you, you're, are you asking about energy in the Carroll world or in the. In the Carroll world, of course. In the Carroll world. Okay, good. So. I mean, for us, energy is 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 this uh, this this Casimir that I call E. Well, it's the value of H, and you can have representations with uh, with any value of H. Indeed. Um, now the question is, for example, th these are these are of course free particles, right? The question is, what happens when you if you have interacting theories with Carroll symmetry, whether you know how, how does it have what kind of excitations can you have and what well, that's a different question i mean this this i should have said when i say quantum particles these are free quantum particles these are just the, the you can try to second quantize this thing i suppose you can try to take a bunch of these 
Um, yeah, I mean the Hamiltonian, of course, is not invariant. It's not. I mean, you don't have a. It, it's not a relativistic invariant. Right? So the energy is not a relativistic invariant. Um, the invariant is p squared and the polyvalence but I mean p squared in the Lorentzian sense. So I mean H. It's part of the contraction procedure that you get that H is also in central. H is not central in, in the right in 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 Wangare. So I'm I'm not yeah I'm, I'm not sure. The uh, point part correction there has an infinite nether symmetry. Right? Okay. Probably. Um, um, I haven't looked at it actually. Yeah. I, um, I suppose because, well. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, you can shift t by arbitrary function of x. Okay. And uh, compensate the variation of t. Yeah, it wasn't for it. It, was, it wasn't for this stuff. This is just simply p q. It's it's any diffeomorphism in the configuration space leaves that one form in there, and there's the pullback of PDQ down to the to the line. Yeah, and we can just really special. 